Hello, I am the uh, Internet Skeptic, and today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering the Internet Skeptic's Guide to Global Warming. Now, this entire presentation I'll be giving can be downloaded from the, the uh, Internet off the website www.theinternetskeptic.com. Uh, you just go to the PowerPoint uh, page and you'll see it there. This version, I apologize for the header there. This morning I had to rush down. Uh, it's, I was on the Bob Rivers show covering some of the material today. But what we're going to do in this presentation today is we're basically going to take a skeptical look, look at the science behind global warming. Uh, I'm going to take the data that Al Gore provides, that the global warming scientists provide, and we're going to take a look at it and take a real critical eye to it. And I'm going to present it to you so that you can decide. I'm not going to tell you what to think. Don't listen to what Al Gore had to say. I'm going to give you the data, and you're going to decide. Does the conclusion reached by the global warming scientists, is it supported by the data that they provide? Okay. Let's take a look at the first chart. Okay. Just recently, we had Al Gore in front of Congress, and he was going through an inter inter interview, and this, uh, he was being interviewed by Joe Barton. Okay. And on one, one of the comments that Joe Barton makes is, on this point, Mr. Vice President, you're not just off a little, you're totally wrong. Right? We're going to review what is he talking about there. Okay? Why would a congressman get in front of basically the nation and say, look, Mr. Gore, I looked at your data. Not only are you a little off, you're totally wrong. And we're going to take a look at what is the science he's referring to that would trigger him to say make that kind of a comment. Okay? What he's taught, here's some just pictures of him during the interview. He gets a little frustrated. If you download this presentation, if you click on this, it'll take you to the YouTube video, and you actually get to see this interview take place. But what he's talking about is he's talking about the major uh, uh, supporting data behind global warming is that CO2 increases leading to an increase in temperature. That's the global warming theory. CO2 drives temperature, right? It's a global warming gas. An increase in CO2 traps heat. It warms the earth. Right. Well, let's take a look. Here is the chart uh, that he's referring to, and this is what... Uh, Joe Barton is referring to when he's talking about you're not off a little, you're off, you're totally wrong. This top chart right here, this is at atmospheric CO2. Okay. The way that they create this chart going back 600 or so thousand years is through ice cores. And as you can see, they trace out throughout the last 600 years the cycle of atmospheric CO2 going up and down. Down on the bottom, they have temperature. And they measure temperature in a similar way using ice cores and other various proxies. The important thing is anytime you have a cause and effect type of a model, the cause has to lead the effect. If I get a bloody nose today, I must have been punched before I get the bloody nose. It makes no sense to have a bloody nose today and get punched two weeks from now. right? So they have to have a chart that would show CO2 increase first and then temperature. Cause is the CO2, effect is the increase in temperature. But if you look real closely when you zoom in on it, you get the exact opposite. This is CO2, and as you can see, CO2, what I've done is I've taken this little sliver and I've magnified it to demonstrate the principle. CO2 remains very high. It's this peak level. Okay. Go down here to temperature, and what's going on with temperature? Temperature, as you can see, falls through the floor. So how could peak temperature cause temperature to increase if all the data shows that it actually falls during peak times? Clearly, CO2 doesn't have much effect on temperature, and yet that is the very foundation of global warming theory. The data that they provide disproves their theory. It doesn't prove it. In fact, the way that you do this in real science is you run a correlation study between these, and you lag the two variables. And what you find is that temperature leads CO2 by 800 years, meaning that see, the temperature increases, it gives time for the Earth to grow, things that grow start to produce CO2, and then CO2 increases. You can actually see this on an annual basis with the seasons. But let's take a little bit, even a closer look at this. This is the chart that Al Gore uses in his movie. Once again, you have CO2 and you have temperature. If you've seen the movie Inconvenient Truth, this is the scene where Al Gore gets on that crane and he goes up and he starts pointing that we're going to a record high. Now, once again, if you have record high CO2, 
and CO2 causes increase, temperature to increase. Wouldn't you want to have a chart that shows record high CO2, record high temperatures? Well, once again, this is Al Gore's data, not mine. Here's the record high CO2. If you look very closely at the temperature, first of all, you'll see there's been plenty of previous peaks of temperature on Al Gore's chart, and they're all one, two, three, four, five of them are all above the current level of temperature. Okay? Yet we have record CO2. If you look really closely, now we're going to zoom in on this part. Actually, we're not. But if you look real closely here, you'll see that the temperature is actually falling. Okay. So we have record high CO2 now, way above where it has been ever before in the past, and yet our temperatures are not even as high as the previous peaks of lower CO2 uh, levels of atmospheric CO2. Okay. Can we interject a comment sure. here? Well, it might, you might get a correlation over a period of time for the simple reason that uh, the CO2, uh, the oceans around the world are a big reservoir of CO2 and they, they drag in CO2. Mm -hmm. So that you, you would naturally expect time lag uh, in, in many atmospheric variables that would probably influence an immediate response, I'll put it that way. Over a period of time, you would definitely expect a response. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought the ocean. We're going to get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, but we've got that one coming. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here's another one. All right. And this is one that uh, you, you can do, and I do with this, this, you know, I try to get high school students to take this into their science class to do this. And I actually, just recently at an event, brought this up with Lonnie Thompson, and I'll go over his response in a little bit. Ignore what this is, is saying, and just... Can just you explain what, who Lonnie Thompson is? I'm sorry, Lonnie Thompson is the, is the uh, uh, head of the Bird Polar Research Center at Ohio State University. He also is the uh, scientist that Al Gore refers to in his movie, He Can Be a Truth. Okay. Well, here are, here are two charts. Okay, You have one thing being measured, another thing being measured, and a third thing being measured. And I'm not going to tell you what they are, um, but when you look at this chart, and I'm willing to bet, if you, I covered up what these labels were, and you took it into a room, and you asked a thousand people which two charts fit best together. Okay? Would you say that fits well with that dark line, or would you say this dotted line fits well with that dark line? I'm willing to bet that if you took this in any classroom in the world and asked them which one seems to have the best fit, they're going to say these two charts seem to overlap or correlate pretty well. If I was to tell you that no, that's not right, this one is the one that correlates best with that, you'd probably say either my eyes are lying to me or I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, that's the global warming theory right there. This is CO2 and this is temperature. Clearly, CO2 and temperature do not fit together very well at all. They're not correlated at all. This is a logarithmic scale. This is a, just a random scale almost. Okay, but this is temperature. This is CO2. This third one, which is another piece of what's really causing global warming, is the solar output. And they measure this through sunspots. So as you can see, as the sun gets hotter, temperatures get hotter. As the sun gets cooler, Temperatures get cool. That shouldn't be a surprise. Now, when you see Lonnie Thompson or the uh, global warming scientists give a talk, they will point out, they try to rule out the sun. And one of the things that they'll say is that uh, the earth has been getting warmer during the winter time than in the summertime. And they use that as a, as a way to rule out the sun. But if you look at the, how the, the globe is warming, it's the northern hemisphere is warming the southern hemisphere really isn't warming at all. So what you have is not global warming, you have northern hemisphere warming. During the winter time in the northern hemisphere, we're the closest to the sun, not farthest away. So a warming sun would be consistent with a warming winter versus the summer. So, the, so when they make a claim to disprove the sun, they're actually proving it. Okay. But once again, this is a very easy way for you to sit there and say, okay, does this correlation fit well? Yes. 
More than likely, it's the sun causing global warming, not CO2. The correlation just isn't there. Okay. Now, you were talking about the oceans. Most people don't know that the oceans are essentially the hemoglobin of the world. They are the ones that regulate the CO2 in the atmosphere. If you look over here, this is the carbon cycle. The oceans produce 100 to 115,000 gigatons of CO2. That's huge. Okay. Man, on the other hand, produces five. So just the variation in the ocean production alone is three times what man produces as a whole. More importantly, there's a natural law that determines the pressure, the partial pressure of atmospheric CO2. It's called Henry's Law. As the temperature of the oceans increase, it releases CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay? You can do this yourself. Take a pop bottle, put it on a burner, and turn up the heat, and what do you see? You see CO2 bubble out of it. Well, that's exactly what happens with the oceans. Okay? As you heat the oceans, it bubbles up CO2. And if you do a calculation according to Henry's Law, what you'll find is that over the last 30 years, since about 1960, the temperature of the oceans have increased by a certain amount, about about a degree or so. That degree is consistent with a 60 parts per million increase in atmospheric CO2, which is almost exactly what has happened. Here's the cycle that's going on. The sun, the sun is warming. The sun heats the oceans. This is a chart of the oceans increasing in temperature. As the temperature of the ocean goes up, they increase atmospheric CO2. So this is consistent using the sun as the model with an increase in CO2, and you don't need to have the industrial production of CO2 at all. The sun does it through the oceans. More importantly, this is another big problem that they, that they have. The only real thing out there... Excuse me, can you slow down? Sure. So the sun makes the ocean go up one degree? Since the 60s, the oceans have increased by about a degree. Isn't that kind of alarming? Uh, it is, if it, but it's a natural cycle. It's a natural. I mean, there's nothing we can do for the sun. We can't right. slow the sun down. Okay, got it. Um, got it. Um, but going back here, uh, the important thing is that uh, the sun, they, they, re, they produce these reports, and they'll show you that the oceans are warming. The atmosphere doesn't warm the ocean. In fact, a lot of times, it's quite the opposite. The oceans warm the atmosphere. So when they have a chart that shows ocean warming, there has to be something other than CO2 warming the oceans. If you look at what really heats the, sun, the oceans, it's the sun. So it's, it's a leap of, it's, it's kind of difficult to argue that CO2 is causing atmospheric warming, but something else is causing the oceans to warm. So what, what, you, what you'd assume is what's causing the oceans to warm is also what's causing the atmosphere to warm. That's not a leap of science. Okay? That's logic, and that's once again is a natural cycle. And it's called Henry's Law, and it's clearly defined. The other thing that's interesting is that if you look over here, because man only produces five gigatons or so of CO2, well within the range that the ocean buffer could absorb. Okay? Now, like again, well, once again, the oceans are like the hemoglobin. If CO2, if we put too much CO2 in the atmosphere, the oceans absorb it. If we pull it out, the oceans will release it. Henry's law determines the partial pressure, not man, not driving SUVs. But I always throw this little interesting caveat in here because this is a measurement of CO2 in the atmosphere. Trees producing CO2 produce 10 times as much CO2 as man. People always say, wait a minute, trees don't produce CO2. They do. Every living organism produces uh, CO2. And plants breathing alone produce 10 times as much CO2 as man does. Now, they also have photosynthesis and they absorb it and eat it and turn it into uh, you know, the tree. Um, the other thing is plants create a great deal of water vapor, and we're going to get to that in a minute also. Well, and also the decay of plants creates CO2 and decay. as well. Sure. Mother Nature produces a huge amount of CO2. Good. What's the reverse of that? There has to be a balance. What, what? How much does it absorb? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. This I know, is, but what's the what's the relative? What's what's the relative magnitude here? Are they equal or? Well, well it, it's it looks a, like it kind of equals out. Yeah, it's a natural balance. Well, Forty and fifty. Okay, go ahead. Well, you can see that the plants through photosynthesis are absorbing about hundred to one hundred twenty.
So once again, the variation alone is four times what man produces. The important take-home message, though, is unless the oceans are saturated, man can't do anything for the atmospheric CO2. If we produce too much, it'll absorb it. If we pull it out, it'll release it. Mother Nature's determining the balance, not man. And once again, unless that's saturated, we'll just keep gobbling up the CO2. Saturating meaning? Saturating is a chemical term. Maybe you can help me out with that. But the bottom line is, as long as you keep... Um, have you ever done like a... Uh, um, you want to explain saturation? Well, each each liquid has a vapor pressure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's determined by the natural condition. If you exceed it... Uh, the oceans can only dissolve a certain amount of CO2 at a given pressure. So that's called a saturation point. If you go below it, the CO2 flashes off. If you go below, if you go under it, it absorbs. So you have a balance. A good way to test this is to take a cup of coffee. You can put sugar in it and it'll dissolve. Once you reach a certain point where it's saturated with sugar, as you put more sugar in it, it won't dissolve and it'll go right to the bottom. Okay? The oceans are nowhere near being uh, saturated with CO2. Alright, All right. well, the other big problem they have is that, you know, they, they focus in on the CO2, but if you look at what really causes CO2, I mean, global warming, it's water vapor. Water vapor is responsible for 95% of the greenhouse effect. And this is, the, this is the biggest problem I have with what they're doing is, I say this all the time and people, they argue with me like water vapor doesn't cause global warming or water vapor's not a greenhouse gas. It is, it's the most significant one. We're gonna get to that. But just by the very fact that they don't tell people about this raises a lot of suspicion in my mind. So if you put all the greenhouse gases together, including CO2 and water vapor, man's contribution to global warming gases is 0.28. That's negligible. It's essentially zero. Now, a normal scientist would look at this and say, you know what? I'm probably not going to pay too much attention to this. I'm going to take a look right here at this big red. I'm willing to bet a small change here is what's causing global warming, not the change right here. Right? I mean, if I'm doing a study on weight loss, I'm going to take a look at exercise and caloric intake, not the type of shoes someone's wearing. I and mean, that's essentially what they're doing. We're going to take a look at this big one. We're going to see, is there something that we've done to tamper with nature that could lead to an increase in water vapor? Well, here it is in a graphical format. Water vapor, once again, is 95%. These are the other greenhouse gases. Now, remember, Water vapor, I mean, uh, CO2, is about 3.5 to 5% of the atmosphere. It's what's called a trace gas. There's just simply not a whole heck of a lot of it to begin with. And then remember, man only produces 5% of that 5%. So it's a highly insignificant amount. Okay. And that's why when you put water vapor in here, you see the CO2 is almost irrelevant. And then remember that a little sliver is what man produces of it. So, it's just the man just simply doesn't produce a whole heck of a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. Then you're saying, well, then every time I see him talk, every time I see Al Gore talk, he says CO2. Well, sure enough, if you pull water vapor out of the greenhouse gases, then CO2 becomes the most significant of the remaining insignificant greenhouse gases. But in order to make this argument, you literally have to ignore water vapor. And when you read the IPCC report, that's exactly what they do. Very rarely do they address um, water vapor. In fact, there's a, a, a factor assigned to these, what's called a global warming potential. Carbon dioxide has a global warming potential of one, and all other gases are rel re measured relative to it. They don't even assign a global warming potential to uh, water vapor. And so the next, well, does water vapor have the capacity to trap heat the way CO2 does? Very much so. We're going to get to that. Five, extremely uh, powerful. That's why rainforests are so hot. Okay. It's like a sun. Okay. okay. Well, here we go. And just getting to your water vapor. Sure enough, we have a way to prove that. 
This is another problem that I have with the global warming theories. And this is actually one of the claims that if you watch that Joe Barton interview of Al Gore, you'll see him refer to this. Joe Barton, Joe Barton was the congressman who, who, who um, questioned Al Gore in the congressional, congr recent congressional, congressional testimony. About what date? Um, I'm not sure. It was just recently. It was just a few weeks ago. April of 07? April of 07. Yeah, I believe April of 07. Okay. Uh, if you download this presentation, you can click on it and you can, you can, it'll take you to the, uh, the actual video. All right. What this is, is well, well, let me go back to what the claim is. Uh, Al Gore and I've seen Lonnie Thompson make the same claim that they claim that the stratospheric cooling is proof that CO2 causes global warming. Now you're saying, why does the stratosphere cooling give you proof of CO2 causing global warming? The theory is, because it's cooling up here, the stratosphere is above 10 kilometers in altitude. What they claim is that it's trapping the CO2 in what's called the troposphere. So the reason it's cooling up here is because the heat doesn't get up there. It's trapped down here. Right? That's the whole theory. And this is, the, this is probably the chart that I'm willing to bet most of you have never seen that pretty much disproves that entire theory. Right? Because I look at this and I say, sure enough, this is pretty suspicious. There is cooling in the stratosphere. There's no argument about this. The yellow, greenish areas here is cooling. The gray areas represent warming. So when you see these gray areas and the darker blues, that are lighter blues, that's warming. This is cooling. They produce this chart and they make that claim. In fact, they even label it CO2 and ozone. Now, you're probably saying, now wait a minute, this guy just said this totally disproves the theory, and he just pointed out to you that CO2 and ozone causes the cooling. Why would he be showing a chart to totally disprove his theory? Right? Clearly, they have produced this chart to make their case, they've labeled it CO2 and ozone. So why would I be sh uh, showing you a chart to prove me wrong? Well, look very carefully. This is the altitude. This is the infrared spectrum. And sure enough, there is an area here that's, absorbed, that's warming, that's why it's blue, and cooling. But the problem that they made was, they me measured this, they, they labeled this the wavelength. Right? Now, a real scientist is going to take a look at that. They're going to, they're going to ignore the label, and they're going to drop per a pendulum right down here, and they're going to notice where it intersects. It intersects at 6.5 microns. Once again, this is their chart. This is their proof to prove CO2 causes global warming. The problem that they had was nobody bothered to check the facts. This is the IR absorption spectrum, and this is what I'd like you to comment on. This is... This is atmospheric CO2's IR absorption. This is water vapor. If you look, somehow I'm gonna, okay? Water, uh, CO2 absorbs at 2.7, 4.3, and 15. Nowhere near 6.5. Can you say what IR is again? Oh, I'm sorry, infrared. infrared. The, the whole theory is that the lower atmosphere, the troposphere, absorbs infrared radiation. During the day, the sun heats the globe, and then at night it releases the heat. Well, the whole theory is that global warming is due to the fact that greenhouse gases trap that heat. That's their whole theory. This is how they prove it. The problem is, the data they provide doesn't prove their theory. Because they produce this, they label this CO2, but if you go down here, you see that the wavelength where the cooling occurs is 6.5 microns. So then you have to what's say, okay. A, what's a it's a wavelength. It's, the, it's, a, it's a measure of length, a very short measure of length. Infrared is a wavelength of light that's a little bit longer than visible light. You have the, you know, the uh, visible spectrum, which is Roy G. Bibb. Roy G. Bibb is sunburn. That's yeah, sunburn. Well, ultra, ultra vitamin, I think, would give you sunburn. Okay, but, but it's part of the, uh, this is the heat light. This is, this is the light that heats the earth. But once again, you see, sure enough, the troposphere is warming. But the problem is, it's warming at 6.5 microns. If you go down here, this is the IR absorption spectrum, because you can tell what molecule is causing that. It's determined by an infrared spectrum. 
CO2 absorbs at 2.7, 4.3, and 15. Nowhere near the 6.5. This is water vapor. If you go over to 6.5, okay, sure enough, peak absorption occurs for water vapor at 6.5. So water vapor using their own data causes the global warming. Okay? Well, what's causing that peak of water vapor? Well, this is determined by the molecule. Okay. Oh, 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 I see. The, well, this this yeah, is basically, I got, I got um, you, you've heard me talk about infrared spectrometry and stuff right. like that. This is basically just the characteristics of a molecule. Okay, okay. It absorbs a certain wavelength. Right. Okay. So their own data proves that water vapor is what's causing the warming. More importantly, they have a chart here that shows bands of, cool, uh, of warming, meaning that it's not being trapped down here, it's getting up there. Well, where do you think these bands of warming in the stratosphere actually occur? Consistent with, no, the CO2 absorption. Okay, at 2.7, 4.3, and 15, this is warming where CO2 absorbs. So CO2 is not, not, not trapping the heat, it's actually releasing it after the stratosphere. It's the exact opposite. Okay? CO2 is consistent with stratosphere warming, not cool. Okay? Showing that it's not trapping that much heat and it's getting up to the stratosphere. More importantly, is this is the total absorption by the atmosphere. Going back to that theory, that picture with the sun overlapping the heat, this is this is total atmospheric absorption of heat. This is the water vapor. They look familiar. Okay, water vapor is consistent with the total absorption in the atmosphere of the heat. There's only one little band here of CO2 that's not overlapped by water vapor. So water vapor dominates the greenhouse gases according to their own chart. So you can use their own chart to disprove their own theory. Where did these charts come from? These, these uh, I can't read the, uh, this comes from some environmental organization. S.A. Cloud and M.J. Iconi, Atmospheric and Environmental Research Data, 1995. The, I'm glad you asked that. Um, all this data, once again, I do not do any original research. What I do is I look at the, the research that they publish. You can download this presentation, click on it, and it'll take you to this so you can do your own research, okay? Because what, what the whole theory of what I'm doing is I can take their own data and disprove their own theory. Um, I give, Every time I give these, these uh, presentations, they attack the data and say, keep attacking it, it's their data. That's junk science, um, okay? But we're, 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 you know, once again, you can take this, ask a thousand uh, elementary school children, does this look like this or does this look like this? They're all going to say this looks a lot like that. Water vapor causes it. CO2 is in, in, yeah, irrelevant. And also remember, CO2, where CO2 absorbs, it overlaps water vapor. So water vapor absorbs that wavelength anyways. Okay. Now, you talked about the water vapor. Well, sure enough, and this is the other suspicious thing, is you won't find any charts like this for CO2, but you do find it for water vapor. And what do you have here? First of all, can we agree that these look pretty identical? I mean, does that look a lot like that? 